Good morning, I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. It's day 409 of our three-year journey through God's Word. We're coming to the end of 1 Samuel, chapter 30 today, chapter 31 tomorrow, and uh, we'll be coming to the end of this first of the two books of Samuel. And that means we're coming to the end. When we get to the end of 1 Samuel, we're coming to the end of David's life before he was king. And 2 Samuel really tracks his life as king. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to spend time in your word each day. Thank you that your word is true and that you are faithful to teach us your word and to grow us in our knowledge, understanding, and love for your word. Help us to walk Father, in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, in paths of obedience and faith for you and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and shall surely rescue. So David set out and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, where those who who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men. Two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the book, the brook Bezor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the uh, Carathites, and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this land. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped, except four hundred young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, And the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. Then David came to the two hundred men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Bezor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. 
And David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into battle, so has so shall his share be who stays with the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, of the Negev, in Jatir, in Eror, in Eror, and Shifmoth, and Eshtemoa, and <clears throat> in Rakal, in the cities of the uh, Jeromelites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Hormoth, in Borashan, in Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. That is 1 Samuel chapter 30 in God's Word in the ESV version. And I'll just tell you, I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, next month, it'll be my 49th birthday. And uh, I've been doing these online devotionals for a while now. And when I get to those names, like at the end of the paragraph, it's not that I have a hard time pronouncing those names. It's that I'm now at the point where I'm having a hard time reading correctly the letters. It's all a little bit blurrier than it was even like six months ago because the old presbyopia is seeping in on me gradually step by step. So anyway, um, I may have to come up with a better solution. You may have to see me wear reading glasses during these uh, scripture readings because most of it I know well enough. I can sort of know what's going on, but I come to those proper names like at the end of that chapter and I'm thinking is that a B or an R is that <laughs> oh well you know that's life when you get older so what do we see here in first Samuel chapter 30 well <clears throat> what we see is David finally being brought to his senses by the Lord he comes back from this battle that he was willing to fight in that God spared him from the great sin of going to war against the Israelites. Think about that. What, what that would have done to his prospects to be king. If he had actually gone into battle alongside the Philistines against Israel, like they would have stopped singing their praises about David. Then he probably would have had no shot of being king. But God is preserving his purposes for David. So he comes back to Ziklag on the third day and he finds that the Amalekites have made a raid and Ziklag has been burned with fire and every one has been taken captive. David's wives and children are captive. All of his men, all 600 men, wives and children are captive. That's a nightmare. That is, that is one of the worst nightmares for a husband or father to imagine coming home and your family is gone. And they've been taken and you don't know by whom and you don't know where. I mean, he's got 600 armed men who are ready to fight, but they don't know. They don't know who did this. They don't know where they went. You know, they, they just, they don't have answers. And so he's greatly distressed. Verse six, the people spoke of stoning him because they were all bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. Imagine that. These 600 men who had been loyal to David through these years of running from Saul, who were willing to go into battle with him against Israel, these 600 men, a lot of them are rough characters. A lot of them are guys from really bad backgrounds with really not so great characters. And now they're saying, well, David led us away from our fortified city and our wives and our daughters were taken, our sons and daughters were taken, and we're going to just stone him and get a new leader. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And here is the turning point of David's story in this dark, dark season. David strengthens himself in the Lord his God. And then, verse 8, David inquired of the Lord. He brings priest, Abiathar, brings the ephod. That's a way of inquiring of the Lord. 
and he inquires of the Lord. This is the turning point. He strengthens himself in the Lord. He inquires of the Lord. That's what we need to do. When we realize we're wrong and sometimes something happens in our lives and we sort of have a wake up moment of like, how wrong have I been? How stupid, how wrong headed, how selfish, how foolish have I been? In that moment, we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God by worshiping him, by calling upon his name, by praying to him. And then we need to inquire of the Lord. What would the Lord have me do? And we may need to apologize to people, ask for forgiveness and be reconciled to broken relationships. We may need to restore something that we had cost someone because of our foolishness. We may need to make it up, you know, if we've been hurting our marriage, we may need to make it up to our wives or our husbands by investing time to spend with them and to go and be together and to rebuild that which our foolishness and our stubbornness had, had taken or or if we were neglectful of our children or whatever, we may need to spend time with them or we may need to, whatever the case may be, right? We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, inquire of the Lord, and then go and do what the Lord tells us to do. In this case, restoring what David's sin had cost them, because it was David's sin that he would march his 600 men up and be willing to go to battle against Israelites. That was his sin. And now to, to take back, to restore what was lost in sin, they need to go and pursue this band, but they need to know if that's God's will, if that's God's pleasure to bless them in that endeavor. And God answers graciously. God first protects David graciously, chapter 29, from going out further in sin. And now God answers graciously and says, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and shall surely rescue. So they go out. There's 600 men. There's 400 men who are able to keep up the pursuit. They're the more young, fit, able-bodied men, and they're able to continue the pursuit. And then you've got 200 men who might be older, or they might be hurt in some way, uh, they might be sick in some way, and they're just not able to go. And so the 400 who go, they find an Egyptian in the open country. They just so happen, right? Just, just coincidence, right? They just so happen to find an Egyptian in the open country. And this man happens to have come from the band that had done all of this raiding. And they also find out from him that it wasn't just Ziklag that they raided, but they've actually, if you, if you go back a couple chapters and listen to what David was telling Achish where he had raided, that's where this band has actually raided. In, in the Negev, the Negev is the, the, the southern desert area of Judah, south of the Dead Sea, south of the Jordan River Valley, down toward Egypt. And, and that's where Caleb went. There were springs there where uh, Caleb settled. And that's also where uh, several other places were. And that's where they, where they raided. And so they, they found out a lot of good information. And then the Egyptian takes them to the band of Amalekites, and David is able to defeat them. I do think um, that verse 17 is a little bit funny. I don't know, it just struck me as humorous. David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David only had 400 men, 400 young men. And there were so many people that they were able to defeat in battle that there were, there were 400 men who escaped. That was the small remnant who was able to flee away on camels. Imagine that battle from, from twilight until the evening of the next day. It's 24 hours of, of, um, of battle and maybe longer because twilight could mean dusk from dusk until dusk, or could mean from dawn of the one day until dusk of the next day. So it's at least 24 hours. It could be 36 hours, but it's a long battle and they defeat them. And, and the miraculous thing, the wonderful thing that God has provided is that every single person got back their wives and their children. David recovered all, nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything. 
it was all recovered. Plus there were flocks and herds, you know, that these Amalekites had picked up other places. And so he brings them all back. And then we have this thing with the 200 who stayed behind. The 200 who had been too exhausted to follow. And these, you know, these worthless men who went with David, wicked and worthless fellows, they said, come on, these guys didn't even go with us into the battle. They don't deserve anything. Okay, give them back their wives and children. Don't give them anything else. And David said, no, we're going to set up a rule. We're going to set up a custom here. As is the share of those who go down to the battle, so shall the share be of those who stay by the baggage. These men did, a, did an important job. They guarded the baggage. They were logistical support, we could say, for the battle. And David makes sure that they are taken care of. Not only that, but he also sends back as best he can to those areas that were raided, all those things that I struggled with at the end of the chapter. Those are all the places that they believe were raided by these Amalekites, and they're doing the best they can at restoring these to them. So where do we see Jesus here? Well, here, once David repents and he seeks the Lord and he's strengthened in the Lord and he inquires of the Lord, he then goes back to being more of a type of Christ. In that Christ is the one who redeems, rescues, and restores. And that's what David's doing here. David is pursuing, he's redeeming that which is lost, he's rescuing that which is captive, he's restoring that which is stolen. And that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus redeems us from the pit, he restores us, he rescues us from captivity to sin and death, and he restores to us what sin has taken away from us, which is our eternal fellowship with God. How do we live out this passage? Well, we already talked about it. We need to do what David did, strengthen ourselves in the Lord and inquire of the Lord. And then we also need to not look down within the body of Christ, a secondary application. Within the body of Christ, we need to not look down our noses at those who have different gifts. Not everyone is called to the same ministry. Not everyone has the same gift. Not everyone has the same abilities. And so we need to be make sure that we are loving everyone and being kind to everyone and rejoicing as one body of Christ despite our diversity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what we've learned from this chapter. We pray that you would write it on our hearts, that it might not just be information we know in our heads, but that it might actually shape the way we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tomorrow we come to a very sad chapter, the end of Saul's story, the death of Saul and Jonathan. Hope you can join us for that. And as always, have a blessed day in the Lord.